Hi everybody, George Dunley here again with another uh, BCH Future vlog. Um, I want to talk about learning versus rails. Okay, so this is a flex, flexion point, you might call, uh, call it, that I've taken notice of. Um, so the classical example of this is, for example, strike. The strike lightning wallet um, basically this is just usd rails right it's you never touch bitcoin um, it's custodial it's geofenced so you can only use it in the us and el salvador um, and in fact uh, i have seen evidence that they even use their own uh, uh, their own lightning network, which is separated from their own lightning network nodes, which are like separate from and don't uh, precisely interop interoperate with the overall uh, lightning network. Um, and, you know, people have, um, you know, at least in the initial plan, it was that people were going to deal in dollars. People are going to get X dollars amount. You know, there's going to be Tether uh, in the in the Chivo wallet, um, which is built, I believe, built on Strike. But anyway, at the end of the day, what is that? That is a fintech system, right? To call that, to call Strike cryptocurrency is, that's really stretching it, right? That's more a fintech system. And by fintech, I mean, you know, financial technology, that basically fintech is like applying the app mentality to the legacy financial system the legacy white market financial system basically you know and so fintech is where they take like like a bank makes a really cool app or maybe even it's like a neo bank you know and it's a cool app um but it's still a bank still a bank it's just a little bit more friendly, right? So for me, that's what fintech is. Are there some opportunities in fintech? Can you make money in fintech? Should so you, should you find, found a fintech? Okay, maybe, sure. I mean, it's not that interesting to me because it's still all about little walled gardens and limits and high fees and, and all the BS of legacy banking, you know? So that's not interesting to me. Uh, and it's just just an, just a just a way, in my opinion, of making legacy white market banking a little more friendly. You know, I mean, it's still like full compliance mode and stuff. You know, um, and so like you know, people could say, well, you know, a, the a bank could make an app where you transact in U.S. dollars, but it works like Bitcoin because it goes across borders as if they didn't exist, right? And like, you know, they're not, they're like taking the Uber approach and they're like kind of pretending that they don't even know that all these nation state restrictions exist, right? Which is, is interesting, but it's not Bitcoin. It's just not Bitcoin. So it's, so that's why I call Strike, it's FinTech USD Rails, right? And so some people may say, well, Bitcoin is too hard to use. You know, there's the high fees and, uh, you know, the waiting uh, for transactions to, to get into a block, you know, because zero conf is not secure on BTC coin. There's the fact that it's not tied to your national identity card, but that you have to, um, you have to, right, you have to store the recovery phrase, the private key, not your keys, not your coins. And so this is how we're going to make Bitcoin accessible to the mainstream, you know? And that's kind of what Strike and Lightning are all about, right? And in that sense, you kind of have to sort of give a grudging thumbs up, like, you know, okay, you sort of did it. But at the same time, like, in the process of doing it, you lost the goddamn plot, bro. You lost the plot. Damn, you are off the rails. Damn. Because nobody has custody, right? Um, and getting custody can be problematic, a pain in the butt or whatever. So really all you did was you created a FinTech USD Rails app and you called it Bitcoin. And so what this does is this just makes it easy for everybody to use. You don't have to, nobody has to really learn anything, right? Um, 
But in the process, of course, you threw out the baby with the bathwater. So on the other hand, there is like the Bitcoin.com wallet, right? Which is a very nice wallet. It's, it's, it's an excellent wallet, except for the, the random issues that seem to be related to their infrastructure. But anyway, it's a beautiful wallet. It has great, um, a great UI. Uh, I think the UX has suffered because like when I scan uh, a QR code now, I have to go through like, uh, I mean, I don't know, three menus, two or three menus in order, before I can pay. That's not, that's not very convenient, but it, it's, it feels like I'm call you know, I'm calling one of those telephone lines. It's, you know, where they're like, press one for this and press two for that. It's, but anyway, it's an outstanding wallet. Like I think all credit to Bitcoin.com, Roger Corbin, uh, Dennis, etc. It's a great wallet. Um, so where was I going with this? But but here's the thing: it it preserves the nature of Bitcoin with the fact that it is non-custodial, and you have to secure your private key, right? So the whole thing about securing your private key, and also the fact that you're not you, you're not dealing with your a fiat currency, right? You're dealing with something else, right? Bitcoin. This throws new people for a loop. People don't clue into this immediately. Some do, but a lot don't, right? Because a lot of people associate the idea of money with their government. Oh, I'm in Colombia, I must have Colombian pesos. Oh, I'm in Nigeria, I must have Nigerian whatever they have. They have some kind of dollar over there, which is crap. But anyway, so the so when you onboard someone in Bolivia or Peru, they, they think, oh, this app ha is my local currency, right? They just assume that right off the bat. So this is where learning comes in, right? Because I said this is, this, this is about learning versus rails. If you're onboarding someone to strike, you don't have to teach them a damn thing, right? Which is nice even though the baby went out with the bathwater, right? But that aspect of it is, is nice. But when you're onboarding people to Bitcoin Cash, it's, there are some things that are not intuitive and therefore that's where the learning comes in, right? So, um, you know, first they have to learn, this is not your local fiat currency, right? Even though they go into the settings and they can say, they can switch the, um, the, the denomination or the showing of the value of the wallet into any of hundreds of different currencies, you know? And so like a noob might look at that and say, oh, I can instantly convert my money into any currency. You're not converting any money here, right? And then some, so like I might say, well, I'm gonna send you a dollar of BCH, right? And so they heard a dollar, right? So like, damn, I got a dollar here. And the problem comes in is, in two weeks, the market fell 10% and they have 90 cents, right? And you told them there are very minimal or no fees. And they're like, holy crap, this, this thing charged me a, a silent fee of 10, 10 cents. After the fact, this is a scam, right? This is really the problem. Yeah, this is one of the problems, right? So people, it has to be, so when people onboard, it has to be impressed upon them that they don't have US dollars. They don't have Nigerian Naira. They don't have Peruvian Sol. They don't have Mexican pesos. They have Bitcoin Cash. And Bitcoin Cash is this money that is not backed by gold or any government. This is a paradigm shift, shift for a lot of people. This blows some people's brains. This blows some people's, whatever. This they, blows their mind, yeah? So this, this, is, this is a point of friction, right? Another point of friction is that, you know, so that people are, first of all, I mean, a lot of people don't have bank accounts, right? But people are used to the bank account paradigm of, holy crap, I lost my bank card. I moved, uh, I need my money, but I do have my, my, my national ID card. So I'll just go to the bank and, um, and I'll get my, I'll get a new card and whatever, you know, and they go to the bank and they present their ID and they look at the ID and they make sure it has the little hologram or whatever. Okay. This is real. We'll give this person access to their account. that has 500 bucks or whatever in it. Problem solved, right? 
This is the paradigm for everything in the nation state world, right? That's how you get access to, to that's, how, that's how you identify yourself as X human being, right? For all kinds of different purposes, right? But the blockchain doesn't work like that. National IDs are not valid. There's nobody to, unless you're custodying crypto for people, there's nobody to examine your ID and say, yep, these private keys belong to you. Go ahead, reclaim your 100 BCH. That doesn't exist. And so what happens is you have, you, despite education, despite repeating it, it doesn't click with people. And so they, uh, they may accumulate 10, 20, 50 bucks worth of, of crypto. And then maybe they forget about it for a little while. And maybe their phone, they reset their phone, which people do. They just wipe it and start all over again. Uh, and they expect, you know, because that's another paradigm, right? Like you download the Gmail app and you log in and bam, all your emails there. You can keep using it, right? And BCH is not like that either, at least the Bitcoin.com wallet, right? The Edge wallet, I think, works like that for what it's worth, even though I'm not a fan of that, you know, but whatever. Um, but they reset their phone, they lose their phone, or they upgrade to a new phone, and they re-down the app, or download the app, and they're like, and it shows zero bounce. And they're like, where the hell is my money? Right? And some people are like, they stole my money, this is a scam, you know? Or I lost my money because your system doesn't work right, and this is a scam, and then I'm gonna spread the word that there's something wrong here, or you have bad customer service, right? Because there's not even any customer service. <laughs> you know? Um, so, um, so, you know, getting people to recognize that the recovery phrase or private key is not just a question of security, and backing it up, you know, just in case or protect your identity or your data or whatever. But it actually represents full and complete control of your account, you know? And like if you, if you move to a no, new phone and you successfully transfer the funds over and you're like, okay, well, my funds are on the new wallet. No, they're on both. They're on both. They're both on the old and the new. And they just hand off their phone to, to somebody else or sell it and they're not careful about wiping the data, then somebody else has access to their wallet. The, you know, so this is why I say, you know, people who are like, well, how many transactions you doing? You know, and they, they, they're thinking about like the crypto as if it were just USD rails, right? Which is the strike mentality. But that's not it. This is a new paradigm. Bitcoin is a new paradigm. And if we're gonna continue with self custody, that adds additional elements. Like it's like there's multiple new paradigms here. And that's why education is so important. And we need to ramp up education. Um, yeah, so that's the whole learning versus rails thing. So hope that was useful. Look forward to your feedback and comments and let's keep building Bitcoin Cash.